So, um, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, tonight we've got Matt Kahn. Uh, I'll just say a few words of introduction. Matt is professor at the Institute of the Environment at UCLA. Uh, he's a world-leading environmental uh, economist. He works at the crossroads between environmental economics and uh, urban economics. Matt studied his PhD in Chicago in 1993, I think, and before that he was here uh, for a year in the LSE studying economic history uh, as part of the general course, uh, I believe. Yeah. Okay, so since then he's published about 100 or more academic uh, publications in leading journals. Uh, the majority of these talking about transportation, cities, the structure of cities, and the relationship of that to environmental amenities and climate change. He's got four published books, uh, two of them on similar topics, uh, one an environmental economics textbook, and another, interestingly, on social networks in war, co-authored with his, uh, his wife, Dora Costa, and drawing on... Uh, social histories of uh, soldiers in the Civil War. Uh, but he's not going to be talking about that tonight. He's going to be talking about um, urban pollution and quality of life in China. And I'm looking forward to this. So without any more words, I'll hand over to Matt. And let's extend a welcome to him in the usual way. Folks, good evening. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. And let's see if I could work the projector. The Ah, folks, I'm a proud LSC graduate. How many LSC students or faculty are in the room? I, so, my goodness, so, so you, you know that you're part of a great institution. And I can't believe that 30 years have passed. Time can move quick. And I barely recognize this campus. I, when I flash back roughly 30 years to my LSC, I, I remember many things. But the, the international friendship, I was a very bad goalie on the, on the football team. And, but my teammates did not hate me for my ineptitude. Uh, the Thatcher re-election was taking place. And Margaret Thatcher did not have that much support on this campus. And, and, but, but there was intellectual debate about everything. And, and my teachers, E.H. Hunt, Dudley Baines, Kurt Klapholtz, Richard Laird, I learned so much. And, and uh, it, the LSEs, uh, the, the rigor of this place and how seriously ideas are taken really helped me to get ready for the University of Chicago, which was an old-fashioned beatdown. Uh, but, but, but the LSE prepared me, and, and, and to this day, I continue to be uh, fascinated by ideas, and I've stayed in touch with the friends I made here. Folks, a, one of the themes I'm going to be talking about tonight in my brief remarks, and I'm very eager for the questions uh, for us to discuss some of the issues in our book, which I'll be getting to very soon. As Steve alluded to, uh, I'm an environmental and urban economist. And so you can just think about London. Was anyone in London in 1986? Some of you may not have been born then. Uh, but, 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 but London is a different city now, for better or worse. And so I'm fascinated by the evolution of cities, whether it's Shanghai today, whether it's London over the last 30 years. Folks, I grew up in New York City in the 1970s, which was a grittier town than Mayor Bloomberg's New York. So I'm very interested in city dynamics and uh, be mainly talking about the environment tonight. And one of the themes in my work is the second to last bullet point, that cities with a great quality of life Yes, real estate prices are going to be high. Folks, have you noticed that London's real estate prices are high? And, and so I'm fascinated by the winners and losers from great quality of life. But that those cities that can supply great quality of life, and we can be precise in how we define those words, that those cities are going to be more robust to the inevitable shocks of recession and bad days that occur through macroeconomic cycles. And a theme in my work is those cities with great quality of life it, that that's a golden goose for in this footloose age to continue to attract young, ambitious people. So one of the themes tonight for folks who care about and are interested in China is uh, London has had a rise as a, in terms of its quality of life. Are there any lessons for Shanghai, Beijing, and other second-tier Chinese cities? Folks, uh, how many of you have not read my first book, uh, Green Cities, Urban Growth of the Environment? Yeah, you, you, all hands rise, please. <laughs> This was my first book, and, and to some degree, the book I'm about to tell you about with Professor Si Chi Zheng of Tsinghua University revisits some of these themes, but I've learned so much in the last 10 years, mainly from her. But green cities have been on my brain for a long time. 
So my work with Xijing. I first met her 10 years ago at Harvard, and I have learned so much from her. She is a real estate expert at Tsinghua University, and there's many links between real estate and cities, which I'll be talking about tonight. And for the last 10 years, uh, we've been working on the causes and consequences of urban pollution in China, and our book, uh, which I hope will come out in 2016, I want to sketch the main themes of the book so you don't have to buy it. Hey, and I, but, but I do want to convey, and, and for the young people in the room, convey some of the research questions that I hope folks will work on. So folks, this is something out of The Economist magazine. Does this dragon look happy to you? Uh, anyone have anything to say to this dragon? I believe in interactive talks. If you, you can start texting each other. The, and, and so The Economist magazine, which we subscribe to, it, it asks the question we all have on the brain. Can China clean up fast enough? And the, the, the economist focus is really on climate change and greenhouse gas emissions. But I'm going to be speaking both about global environmental issues and about local air and water pollution tonight. So folks, a couple of facts. Based on ambient air pollution measured by PM10, 12 of, Ch of the world's 20 dirtiest cities are in China. Uh, we can talk about why that's the case and our optimism of progress in these cities. Folks, a little bit of data, since I'm going to give you a quiz later. Uh, time goes from the year 2000 to the year 2012. And on the vertical axis, we're graphing for Beijing PM10. So the higher this is, and maybe I will use my laser pointer without poking anybody. Folks, am I? Maybe I'm not going to use my laser pointer. I'm going to put down my weapon. Folks, take a look. Does everyone see over the time period 2000 to 2007 a high mean of roughly 160? Folks, Los Angeles is roughly at 40. And Los Angeles is one of America's dirtier cities. So does everyone see in the, in the early period Beijing having air pollution that's roughly four times LA? Notice, does, folks, do you remember the Olympics, the 2008 Olympics? Jimmy Page playing that guitar, David Beckham kicking some soccer ball. Folks, do you see the enormous reduction in PM10 as they shut the factories and ban driving? So it's interesting, there have been papers in economics on the natural experiment of when the Chinese government puts its muscle behind cleaning up a city. Do you see a regime break? Now, Notice that there's some mean reversion. Notice that after the Olympics it goes up, but do you see that the new mean is roughly 25% lower than the original mean? So, I, so these are interesting facts. If anyone wants to boo, you are free to. Folks, notice that Beijing has enjoyed some air pollution progress during a time when its population grew and its per capita income grew. So it is not a law of physics that pollution just rises as there's more people and more consumption. There's a question of the quality of, of, of economic growth. And there's a little bit of optimism in this picture. Folks, do I have some optimists in the room? Can we have the win-win of economic growth and a cleaner environment? Yes. Thank you. Yes, we can. Good. There we are. Good night. The, um, <laughs> folks, now some bad news. So this is the challenge of climate change. And time goes from the year 1960, and somehow time ends in the year 2008. Don't ask. Uh, this is World Bank data. On the vertical axis are tons of carbon dioxide. And of course, carbon dioxide exacerbates the challenge of climate change. Folks, I graphed three lines for you. The circle line is the world. The square line is India. The triangle line is China. If I gave you a final exam right now, it, and this is per capita emissions, so per person, does everyone see that India is just slowly rising? Its global externality is increasing. Folks, do you notice that China, the acceleration of China's emissions starting in 2001, the much steeper slope? And so an unintended consequence of China's 8 or 9% growth per year has been over the, starting in 2001, has been very sharp growth in its carbon dioxide emissions. And the world's emissions is rising also, exacerbating the challenge of climate change. And so when we talk about green cities, I want you to think about both clean air, clean water, safe food, but also mitigating the challenge of climate change, both local and global criteria. So folks, our book, 
And what I'm really going to talk about tonight in the name of saving time and to focus on our contributions is points number two and three. For better or worse, I'm an economist. I'm married to an economist. I'm worried my son will become an economist. <laughs> and uh, you should hear the stuff that comes out of his mouth. And I don't know where it comes from. I, I do know where it comes from. And it makes me take a second look at what I must be saying. The, he's the son of two Chicago economists, for better or worse. Folks, on the supply side, China's pollution has come about as an unintended consequence of its economic growth. Uh, the consumption of coal, the rise of car use, and industrial production in China, which has helped to fuel China's rise as a middle class and rising nation, but it's had the unintended consequence of ample pollution production. More interesting, I hope to you guys, is what I'm going to say on the demand side, where Sichi and I conjecture and I want to show you some evidence of the rising demand for blue skies among China's urbanites. And folks, I also want to talk about government. I'm a political realist. For the Chinese Communist Party and for mayors and for Beijing central government figures, I want to talk about the political economy of implementing and enforcing local and global pollution mitigation policies. To say that uh, intuitively, do the leaders of China have any incentives to deliver blue skies and to deliver policies that people in London now take for granted, people in Los Angeles now take for granted. And so I'm really going to spend the bulk of my time before our questions and answers on the demand side and government's incentives. And there's going to be plenty of potential topics for folks to work on in debate. A slide before I hit the gas pedal. For the economists in the room, the challenge that every city faces is Nobody intentionally seeks to make their city polluted. Uh, whether it's a cigar smoker, a car driver, um, somebody throwing out litter, there's often, a, this, an, there's often people have private choices that have social consequences. And in China today, coal is actively consumed, and we know why. Coal is a fuel that China is endowed with, but an unintended consequence of consuming this cheap fuel is to, it, yes, it raises economic development, but it raises air pollution at the same time. And so what interests me very much is thinking about China's standard of living. If China's economy is growing by 7 or 8% per year, but if pollution is getting worse and worse, is the standard of living improving by 7% a year? And I'm going to talk about green accounting at the end, but that's something I want you to think about. And so no individual citizen on his or her own has an incentive to tackle these externalities. And so there's a fundamental role for government to step in. But will government step in? So folks, now to say some new things. Why are Sichi and I so optimistic? Do we just, are we just living in fantasy land? I hope not. But, but I, our starting point is that more educated people are, are more likely to demand environmental protection. Folks, at UCLA, I teach hundreds of very talented Chinese young students. And I, a rising trend in China is more and more students going to college. And a, a theme in environmental economics is as people grow richer and more educated, a greater willingness to pay for there to be less risk in your life, safer food, cleaner air, cleaner water, and that there's a demand side for living in cleaner cities. And I'll talk about whether government is likely to respond to this demand. Folks, point number two is that cities all over the world have reinvented themselves. New York City in the 1970s, London in the 1970s, Chicago in the 1980s. These were dirty, grungy cities, uh, which have made dramatic comebacks. Now the third point. Ed Glazer, in his terrific book, The Triumph of the City, and Enrico Moretti, in his terrific book, The New Geography of Jobs, both have argued that the golden goose for urban growth is human capital. Those cities that can attract and retain and grow skilled individuals are more likely to boom as cities. So folks, uh, if, if for the younger people in this room, how many of you expect to stay in London or would like to stay in London upon finishing this place? Everyone is out of here? How many want to join me in Los Angeles? <laughs> so I ask my students at UCLA, I say, how many of you are going to move to Detroit? And nobody raises a hand. And, and so the question is, if, if under my thesis, 
If Detroit, despite its cold weather, could figure out a way to improve its quality of life, improve its school system, and attract, retain, and grow more skilled young people, this would provide a micro foundation, more human capital in the city, for it to grow as a city. So China in the past, its growth has been industrial factories. An idea I want you guys thinking about is that for many coastal cities in China, an urge to become a San Francisco, that the new golden goose will be the brain. Zuckerberg's with a Chinese name. Can anyone translate Zuckerberg into Chinese? I cannot. I will not try. Well, well thank you. Thank you for trying. I have a new friend. And, and, and but un, during Mao's time, that might not have been imaginable. But in a changing economy, using the brain to its full potential, and folks, pollution slows down the brain, is where I'm going in one slide. As Sichi has explained to me, folks, I have just one child, a 13-year-old child. Sichi uh, has one son. She, her, her son is five years old. China's 421 demography. Four grandparents, two parents, one child. When you only have one child, it is risky to have that child in a high pollution, risky society. And so, folks, I take very seriously the second slide. My teacher, Jim Heckman, from the University of Chicago, is doing great work on the economics of skill formation. That a, it, it, he's asking the question, for every child under the age of five in the world, how do you maximize the probability that this child has the chance to live up to his or her full potential? And of course, in, in some of his work, he emphasizes pre-K and it's sending children to school before age five to prepare them to be successful young people, but being exposed to low pollution, clean air, and clean water as key inputs in, in, in starting your career to succeed in schools. Learning begets learning, skill begets skill. And Chinese parents being aware of this, of the importance of clean food, clean air, clean water, makes these urban middle class households a, a lobbying group for improved environmental quality. Folks, uh, how many of you have read my paper with my wife? Uh, cost and I'm always looking for new citations. <laughs> I've, I've got two hands. That's better than usual. And so folks, in, in a paper Dora and I wrote 11 years ago, we documented that as people grow richer, they demand less risk in their life. And if, maybe it's worth spending one minute how we did this. What we did was the following. Folks, do we agree that different jobs have different risks, like being working in construction is more risky than being an economics professor. And so what economists have done is we, what we, we estimate how much extra you have to be paid for combat pay. When you put yourself at risk, how much of a wage premium do you have to be paid to lure people to work in risky jobs? And what Dora and I did in this paper is we, we estimated these hedonic wage regressions in every decade for 60 years, and we documented that the risk premium you have to pay workers to work in construction and as mine, as in mining is growing faster than GDP. So given China's fast economic growth, if our logic goes through for China, and our study was based on the United States data, the people of China, as they grow richer, are going to be increasingly willing to pay to be exposed to less risk. Folks, the environmental J-curve hypothesis, and this will be on your quiz later, the environmental J-curve hypothesis posits that as middle-income nations grow richer, they demand a cleaner environment, and they're willing to pay more. And so the, the J-curve is graphing per capita income on the x-axis and regulatory stringency on the vertical axis. And again, as nations grow richer, that they increasingly don't have paper tiger regulation, that they enforce regulation. So folks, did you know that the president of Tsinghua University just left that job to become the leader of China's Ministry of Environmental Protection? find that interesting. If they're just looking for a party man to say, yeah, yes, sir, yes, sir, why would this world-leading physicist leave Tsinghua to take that job? And so Sichi and I are very interested in the manpower and woman power who are joining China's Ministry of Environmental Protection. And we think it's the J-curve hypothesis of an increased demand for environmental protection in incentivizing the this, this, this central government to invest more in protecting the environment. Folks, I now want to hypnotize you, showing you a little bit of what Sichi and I do all day long. And let's do it like this. Sichi's one of the world's leading experts on real estate in China. Folks, do you recognize Beijing here? Do you see the ring roads? Uh, how many folks here have been to Beijing? 
This is a sophisticated crowd. You don't need me. And so what C the first time Sichi and I met at my MBR office, she said to me, I have data on the sales price of every home in Beijing uh, over these years in the mid-2000s. I said, that's terrific. Let's calculate the price per square foot, and let's see if in a communist country how real estate is priced. So folks, a question, and let me crack a bad joke. Uh, if, if, should there be any relationship in a communist country between price per square foot of real estate and the characteristics of housing? In communism, aren't we all treated equally? So a square foot of housing is a square foot? That was a joke. <laughs> a, a, so in capitalism, a, so, so what we do in this paper, in this paper that was published seven years ago now, is we put on a map using GIS software, we put on a map every, tra every apartment that was sold in Beijing during these years, and we asked the following question. Where is the price per square foot of Beijing real estate high? Folks, let's play a game, Let, and you're going to use your clickers to vote. This will be like American Idol. What is the British equivalent? You've got no talent? We, um, <laughs> folks, all else equal, if an apartment is closer to the city center, more or less expensive? More. more. If it is closer to great universities, more or less expensive? More. If it's closer to a fast subway line, more or less expensive? More. And so what Sichi and I were doing was decomposing the price per square foot, trying to understand what are the fundamentals uh, while China is nominally a communist country, there are many markets in China, and prices reveal people's priorities. And so what Sichi and her GIS team did was we coded up the price per square foot, but we also coded up characteristics of what the housing was exposed to. Where are the subway stations? Where are the good primary and middle schools? Where are the key universities, which included hers? Where is the green space and the air quality? And folks, we then use the tool of multivariate regression. So how many folks here was the highlight of your life, the linear regression model? <laughs> so as statistical nerds, we decompose the price. We price different apartments. Imagine picking up an apartment and placing it in different parts of Beijing that differ along these four dimensions. And folks, our test of the green city hypothesis is we found that all else equal, apartments closer to green parks and, and Apartments in those parts of the city where air quality was better sold for a, a, a price premium. So an economist tests for whether people are vote with their wallet by looking at whether real estate prices are higher in those areas with more green attributes. That intuitively is our test of Chinese people revealing their willingness to pay for environmental features. And this was one of the first papers documenting a fairly large willingness to pay based on price premiums for real estate as a function of clean air. Folks, I now want to talk about masks. Has, have any of you bought anything on Taobao recently? What would you buy? Interesting. For, for London or for? You might be in our data set. So folks, something that interests me very much is if you do not want to be exposed to pollution in China, you can hope that the state helps to reduce emissions, or you can protect yourself by purchasing masks and air filters. What, my, what our co-author Chung Soon did was we collected daily data from Taobao on internet sales of masks and air filters. And folks, now I want to say something interesting. In China, every day in the major cities, the government announces how polluted it is that day. And I'm going to make you only reach to please nobody boo. But out of respect to you guys, I wanted to show you some numbers. But as the Nobel laureate Robert Lucas once said to us, if I want numbers, I'll look in a phone book. But, um, but, but I, 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 I want to show you something here. Folks, we're going to look at the propensity of people in China to purchase masks and filters. And we have two placebos, purchases of socks and towels. And here's what we find. Relative to a day when the day is excellent out, so the government announces each day, is air pollution excellent, good, lightly polluted, moderately polluted, heavily polluted, or severely polluted? And folks, people can use their iPhone to look up on their app how polluted outside it is. So everyone's comfortable that there's six, there's six grades of outdoor air pollution. 
Notice the monotone, notice that ma oh, masks are much cheaper than filters. Folks, do you see the monotonic coefficients? The more polluted it is outside, the more likely people are to purchase masks. People trust their government and are responding to the information that it's a polluted day by engaging in costly averting behavior. Notice that they're not purchasing more socks on those days. Can I get a half laugh? That's called a placebo. Thank you. That's called a placebo tested economics. Folks, filters also, uh, air filters and masks both have this monotonic pattern. The more polluted the government announces the day, the more private self expenditure people are engaging in to protect themselves. Folks, this may interest you more for people interested in environmental justice. China, even though it's a communist country, has rising income inequality. There's a 1% and a 99% in China, and the Communist Party is very worried about this. And researchers working on Gini coefficients are often asked uh, to, to privately report those data to the government. The, folks, take a look at this. This is a little more complicated, and I don't want to blow anyone's mind. What we're finding here is we're able to divide our data into poor households, middle-income households, and high-income households. And we ask the following question. When PM 2.5 is very high in a city, relative to poor people, rich people are purchasing more filters. And so the rich are better. Now stop looking at my econometrics. And I apologize for that. The econometrics is now over. But the intellectual point I want you guys to learn from this slide is that the rich, with their resources, are engaging in more self-protection against air pollution than the poor. So both the rich and the poor purchase more masks when it's more polluted outside. But because filters are much more expensive, it's the high-income groups that are responding to higher outdoor pollution by purchasing these effective indoor filters. So the rich always have more resources to self-protect. The poor, for them to be exposed to less pollution, will require government intervention. Folks, something that interests me and Sichi very much are China's bullet trains. Have any of you been on one of China's bullet trains? It's, it was quite an experience. I, I, it, I, Californians are worried that Jerry Brown will spend $65 billion on a bullet train for us. We will see if that's a cost-effective investment. And China used to have a domestic passport system, the Hukou system, which limited the ability to move across cities. Sichi and I published a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences where we took a look at China's bullet trains. And I want to tell you a quick story about the rise of the system of cities. Let's do it like this. Folks, here is a map of Beijing. And I once took a bullet train by myself from Tianjin to Beijing. My friends in Tianjin thought they'd never see me again, that I'd end up in North Korea. But I successfully made it back from Tianjin to Beijing on my own. Folks, something from the law of physics. In the year 2006, before the bullet train was built, it took roughly two hours to get from Tianjin to Beijing. With the bullet train, it is 30 minutes. What the bullet train does, whether it's in Beijing, whether it's in Shanghai, effectively what it does is it increases the menu for Chinese people. If the mega cities of Guangzhou, Shanghai, or Beijing become unlivable because of high home prices, the bullet train creates the possibility of decentralizing economic activity to second tier cities. I'm going to have trouble pronouncing these. Can I point to one and get a pronunciation? Somebody help an old professor? You guys are good. I hope to visit that next time. Hey, with the rise of the bullet train, the Chinese people are not passive victims of pollution and mega city growth because you now have more options. You could live in a cheaper second tier city and commute one day a week to these first tier cities. These bullet trains create the potential. These are cities uh, too close to fly to the superstar cities, but too far to drive. Bullet train technology creates this possibility of decentralizing economic activity and creates a safety valve. And, and, and interesting issues for London and for other European cities of, of, of the role that fast transportation technology plays in creating a menu for different people. Uh, so if you're a middle class household and couldn't afford an apartment in Shanghai, but you need some access to Shanghai, the introduction of a bullet train creates a possibility of living in one of these second tier cities. So what Sichi and I did in our 2013 paper is we documented home prices soaring in those second tier cities 
close to the superstar cities that were connected to the superstar cities by bullet train. And again, that these second tier cities act as a safety valve and protect the population if the mega cities get too big. Folks, in the last part of my talk, I want to talk about government officials' incentives to go green. And this may be the most controversial part of the paper. Uh, the people of China do not vote in elections. So if they increasingly demand blue skies, will politicians and leaders of cities deliver? As Sichi has explained to me, under the old rules, politicians in, Beige, uh, politicians in China were evaluated on two criteria. Was their city growing and were there any riots? If you wanted to rise in the Chinese system as a mayor, you wanted to be the boss of a city with GDP growth and with social stability. In recent years, pollution criteria have been introduced into the promotion criteria. So folks, the, the Beijing central government evaluates all of its local officials on a vector of characteristics and decides who to move up and who to demote in the system. And in recent years, pollution criteria, particulate matter and energy efficiency, have been introduced into the promotion criteria. Folks, how many of you subscribe to regional science and urban economics? That's what I thought. Why did I just become its editor? The, um, so, so we published this paper two years ago, and I'd like to tell you some of the results so you don't have to read the paper. And, and, and again, as an eternal optimist, but not as a wishful thinker, I wanted to write with my co-authors a paper on the following. If the people of a nation increasingly want a cleaner environment, Will their leaders supply such public goods even if the people do not have a direct ability to vote? And that was the question we took on in this paper that I'd like to tell you a little about in my final 10 minutes before we open up our discussion. Folks, first, I apologize for all these bullet points, but for the urban scholars in the room, this may interest you. Folks, one of the major polluters in China has been industry. I bet several of you have a product made in China on you. Uh, can anyone wave one of those to me? Uh, a phone? Wait, sit down. No, no, okay, now I'm getting scared. I want to talk about the incentives of China's mayors. Folks, China does not have a property tax. Point number two, manufacturing is highly land intensive. Do, do, have you ever seen manufacturing in a skyscraper? Do you produce a car and move it up to the 17th floor to paint it, then send it to the 15th floor? No. And so manufacturing is highly land intensive. And under Ch when China was a pure communist state, SOE stands for state-owned enterprises. China's state-owned enterprises are less productive than its private sector firms. Under Mao, what happened was, was that there was, and under Deng also, there were manufacturing plants in very valuable parts of the city, sitting on land that was very valuable. Third bullet point, recognizing this point, a smart mayor will close down old communist manufacturing plants that take up a lot of center city land. This mayor would then remediate the pollution and auction it off to developers. So folks, and the reason the mayor would do this is self-interest. The, there's an opportunity cost to, to the land that that manufacturing plant sits on. If you got rid of that manufacturing plant and moved it somewhere else, you could build a new manufacturing plant there, which would be cleaner, and the land that that plant was sitting on can be sold off and built to much higher density, and the mayor will get rich off the land auction. So folks, I, I hope you see how I play the game. I'm interested in the incentives of important, powerful players in China to address the pollution issue. So a mayor out of his or her own self-interest has an incentive to, for the cities, for his or her city to deindustrialize to pick up the land to sell off to real estate developers if this is a city transitioning to services. And this is what we're seeing in the coastal cities in China. Folks, I, something that has interested me very much is the transition of cities. So Pittsburgh used to be a very dirty city in the United States. Pittsburgh Steelers, it's specialized in steel. An unintended consequence of the deindustrialization of Pittsburgh was it becoming a, a green city, a city focused around Carnegie Mellon and the University of Pittsburgh, a city focused around medicine and education? And so major cities in the United States have deindustrialized. Sichi and I are very interested in the second bullet point of China's coastal cities deindustrializing as wages rise, high land costs, and environmental regulations rising, as I alluded to before. 
And as the case of Pittsburgh and Chicago and even London show, large green city benefits of deindustrialization. So a point that interests me and Sichi very much is more coastal Chinese cities making this transition to being places where the skilled want to live their lives. Uh, so when you hear that Silicon Valley is thriving in California, how much of that is due that it's a great place to live? And, that, and it, so Silicon Valley solves a coordination problem. Skilled people want to live near each other, and quality of life attracts them, and then th that reinforces building their companies there in this footloose age. Our critics, when they've heard us make these arguments, have asked us, for how many Chinese cities could the, their future golden goose be not in the industry? And I think this is an important question, but with the rise of human capital in China, I think it's true for many cities. But China has hundreds of cities, and some will continue to choose to be industrial cities. But the Chinese people will have a choice with the relaxation of the hukou system of whether they want to live there and work there or not. Folks, I want to show you a sandwich. How many folks are hungry? Sichi really doesn't like me to present the sandwich. Folks, here's the story of the sandwich, and I'm down to just four or five slides, so I hope you enjoy this sandwich. Our story for how progress is going to occur in China has twofold. For reasons I'm going to tell you in a slide, the central government is increasingly prioritizing environmental protection. And that's putting pressure on the local mayors to actually step up and address pollution. Folks, the public is increasingly demanding through microblogs a cleaner environment. So the, so the reason we have this sandwich is that the mayors are the meat. I don't know what kind of marshmallow sandwich this is. The mayors are the meat, and they're being squeezed in the middle by the people demanding blue skies and the government demanding environmental progress for reasons I'm going to tell you about in a slide. And so even if mayors don't give a damn about cleaning the environment, but if they care about being promoted in the system, they are increasingly incentivized to address this. And in our book, Sichi sat down and interviewed many Chinese mayors who went to Tsinghua University. And these men and women said to Sichi that they're thinking with the rise of the urban middle class in China, that they're thinking through what are the green, beautiful amenities of their city and how to accentuate these to compete, compete for tourism and to compete for business. So out of self-interest, an incentive for local officials to prioritize the environment during a time of rising human capital and rising concern about the environment in China. Folks, a key, key point. Because of the microblogs, the people of China and information decentralization, yes, the Chinese Communist Party tries to control information. Have any of you tried to get to, on Google when you've been in mainland China? I spend a lot of time using Bing. The, um, a, but but a, that was a half joke. A, there is the ability in China, a, a, whether it's cities close to Hong Kong, whether it's those a, a jumping over the firewall, a, the urbanites in China know much more about their exposure to pollution than they did in the past. Microblogs are a key piece of information. There is free speech in China on environmental issues. Th that, that, that video under the dome was freely distributed for a while, but it, but it, it was it, when for reasons I don't fully understand, after a while it was not freely distributed. But, but, but even with the, the, my Chinese co-authors are very confident that the environment is not a sensitive issue, a, and that it's an important issue that the leadership is actively willing to debate. Many Chinese people have traveled abroad, and I want to talk about information competition. So folks, do you know that the US Embassy has its own independent measuring of PM 2.5? And so a very interesting duopoly game was played in 2011. So on October 22nd, the Ministry of Environmental Protection announced that it was slightly polluted outside, and the US Embassy announced that it was hazardous outside. A very interesting thing happened that the Chinese people, as it was explained to me, uh, while the Chinese government at first said, well, just ignore the US Embassy's readings, we are telling you the true readings, very quickly, the Ministry of Environmental Protection switched over to monitoring PM 2.5. And the correlation of their announcements and the US Embassy's announcements went very high very quickly. The threat of information competition 
induced uh, the Chinese government to change its protocols for what information it shares with people. I documented before that self-protection is a function of government announcements. People are more likely to engage in self-protection if they know the truth. Uh, if they're told that it's a good day, what is very unhealthy, they're going to underinvest in self-protection. So competition from independent sources of information provide an incentive for the Communist Party to play it straight and to not manipulate information. And information is crucial for making good decisions, as we all know. So I gave you this slide before. We're seeing, I think, some very exciting work could be done by young people on, on civil society. In the past, the media ignored environmental issues. But as more and more people are interested in environmental issues in China, the media is covering these issues more and more. There was weak public participation. NGOs were weak and regulated. There's increased discussion of environmental lawsuits in China and the growth of civil society playing a role. So in the United States, someone like Robert Kennedy Jr. plays an active role suing corporations who he believes have violated clean water rules. You're going to see a similar rise in China as young people enter this field as, and I hope feel emboldened that they can pursue these lawsuits without fear of political backlash. There's a question how they finance these lawsuits, but this this getting civil society up and going is a way to incentivize politicians to take these issues seriously. Two slides and I'm done. Something that fascinates us is the motivation of the central government to pursue the green agenda. Point number one that Sichi and I have argued is that the national government is responding to a rising green demand of the growing urban middle class. A second reason is China's well aware that energy is a key input in its economy. And in a growing economy, if you have more renewable power and more ability to produce wind turbines and solar panels, that this mitigates concerns about blackouts and shortages. Third, while President Obama, while we'll all go to Paris this summer for a new global low carbon deal, China is making investments in the green economy, anticipating that a future growth sector for China could be exporting wind turbines and solar panels. So folks, I published a paper three years ago that China is now 50% of America's solar panels are coming from China. And, 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 and that this did not exist 10 years ago. So that this, this green economy uh, as an export industry creates another incentive for China to go green. Folks, the fourth explanation is perhaps the most controversial. Alex Wang is my colleague at, Har at UCLA Law School, and he wrote the following. The last explanation is that the central government seeks legitimacy with its own people and also in the international arena. And making a commitment to pursuing environmental goals is one way to credibly signal to both domestic constituents and international actors that China is an international leader and the Communist Party's leadership cares about its own people. So folks, there's hard power and there's soft power. The New York Times is writing daily articles about new islands popping up near China. But there's also soft power in international relations. And if, you, if a nation makes positive strides to not be a villain, do you remember that dragon grabbing the earth? It, this talk was that boring. The, for a nation who engages in making legitimate attempts at engaging in soft power and leading by example, you have more credibility in international relations. And so there's a set of phenomena that there's a confluence working together towards environmental progress in China. So to sum up and wrap up, our optimistic view about the rise of China's blue skies hinges on the rising middle class's demand for quality of life. It also hinges on the increased information transparency and the rise of civil society and an active media, a New York Times uh, type media, that encourages the accountability of government and polluting firms. The inclusion of sustainability in judging the performance of local politicians. Folks, the last two points, city mayors experimenting and competing. I'm very interested that Mike Bloomberg when he was New York City's mayor, experimented with many ideas. So he wanted to introduce road pricing. He wanted to ban large sodas. Would any of you have voted for that as a key policy? So he, he, he did not win. That would have been binding for me. But it's, um, 
he was willing to try out new ideas. I'm very interested in the risk aversion of mayors. Which mayors are willing to try new out of the box ideas? Because ideas are public goods, those ideas that turn out to be good ones. So when the leader in Singapore, when, we, when there was road pricing in Singapore, it interests me. Singapore has become a low congestion city. Why haven't more cities adopted that policy? It, it interests me when we discover good urban ideas that improve quality of life, when do they diffuse broadly versus when don't they? Folks, another source of our optimism is endogenous technological transfer. As the United States and Germany makes progress on renewables of this technology moving to China, another example of ideas as public goods and the potential to produce electricity with much lower greenhouse gas emissions. Our pessimism, and this is my last slide, China's greenhouse gas emissions are very high. There's a question of, of if we don't adopt a cap and trade program, will we see China reduce its greenhouse gas emissions? China has a lot of coal, and the world is hoping that China does not burn that coal. The, the energy ladder that the World Bank talks about tells us that as nations grow richer, they move up the energy ladder from dirty fuels like coal to cleaner fuels like natural gas, just as London did. Uh, my hope is that China will do so. The transition would be much faster if there was a price on carbon dioxide. And it will interest me very much this summer whether China it, it, it works with the United States and other world nations to, to put a price on carbon to begin to mitigate climate change. Steve, I'd like to open this up for questions. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, we'll move straight on to questions. Is there a microphone? Well, you could probably... Hi, I'm Toby and I'm a PhD student there you go. Um, at King's College London and my research is on... Oh, sorry. Okay. Hi, I'm Toby. I'm from... Okay, this doesn't work. Sorry. Okay. So, the better? <laughs> I don't think it's on and there's no button to press, so... Okay, let's try this one. Okay, hi. Um, I'm Toby. I'm a PhD student at King's College London, and my research is on Chinese nationalism. So actually, my research also tackles the question of social stability. Um, you mentioned that it's mainly the Chinese middle class which basically demands a cleaner environment, right? And I was wondering, what about those people who are considerably poor, you know, because they still highly depend on uh, China's uh, still remarkable economic growth. Do you think uh, it's possible to like implement like an efficient environmental friendly policy without like hurting economic growth in China? So I showed you those results that the poor are investing less in self-protection. Where Sichi and I have debated this. Some of our critics have have asked uh, They've said, Matt, yes, San Francisco is a great city, but the middle class and poor can't live there. Uh, it, rents are very high. And that comes to a research agenda that several MSC faculty are working on, on the, the ability to build housing. But to, to your question, I love your question. I think what, what, Cici, what Cici and I hope for is the following. China will continue to have manufacturing. The United States our urban poor would have better opportunities if there was more manufacturing in the US. What you want is the sweet spot of manufacturing jobs, but with less pollution. And so there, my, remember what I said? I had that slide where the state-owned enterprises close in a coastal city and a factory moves to the west. A key issue is for that western factory, what technology, how dirty is it? It, do I, if there's some environmental engineers in the room, if new technology is much cleaner than older capital, you can have the win-win of economic growth and lower pollution. To build on your point, some of the mayors that Sichi interviewed explicitly said, our city is poor, my people need jobs. I need to focus on jobs rather than your blue sky stuff. I'm well aware that it's polluted, but to me that means there's jobs for my people. And so the, the way what a King Solomon would do here, how, how do we achieve the win-win, is technology transfer. Is there a way to build factories such that there are jobs 
for non-college graduates, but that you, you, the firms are incentivized to reduce their pollution. And I think we'd have to look at that on a case-by-case -case basis. But we are well aware that there will continue to be industrial production in China. I want people to have a choice. So when my grandfather came to the US in, in 1919, he lived in a very small apartment and he only finished seventh grade. So in two generations, the family was doing much better. And so there's a question of what is the Chinese dream? So for people who live in the informal sector and, and have to get a foot on the ladder the way my grandfather did, for their children, will they be in a, in a, in a green city? But, but your point is well, and I think one way to have social stability is for there to be an optimism that quality of life is improving, that the standard of living is improving. From there. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ronan Tynan. Uh, I, the one very insightful thing I heard about China, I read about China once, that it's such a big and complex country, you could make a case about anything and you'd probably be right. So with uh, great respect for what you've said, I, I, I bear that in mind as I'm asking this question. One of the key points you made is that um, our environment in the West owes a great deal to transparency, free media, etc. And I put it to you, really, isn't that so far? This is what worries me about China. You know, people talk about China as if it's a liberal democracy. And mind you, I personally don't believe the government are responsible for the environment or for environmental cleanliness in the UK. I don't believe the regulars. I believe people are. And I believe their freedom to pursue that, that agenda is the reason for it. You don't think that's a real fundamental problem at the moment, like Gao Yu getting seven years for document, allegedly leaking document number nine when everybody knew what it was. It was certainly well about, you know, condemning freedom of the press and not promote various ideas, and the recent national security law, and the recent law about NGOs. I mean, it's really quite a fearful agenda Xi Jinping is pushing. And even you talked about NGOs. I mean, now they're going to be very strictly regulated. And also, I was intrigued by the fact that the president of Tsinghua goes to the environmental agency, which actually was involved in making that documentary under the dome, which was subsequently pulled. So clearly, there is tension. So there are hardliners and there are liberals, this is a very crude oversimplification. And I put it to you that really Xi Jinping has asserted that the hardliners are now in power. And I, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to be pessimistic, but I'm almost compelled to be. What I'm really saying is if China doesn't have the rights and freedoms we have to protect our environment, because our governments always will tend under pressure, like the mayors you spoke about, to give way under pressure for the sake of economic growth, you know, is there a problem with your thesis? Thank you. <laughs> so there's a lot of, you raised a series of excellent points, and I have debated that with, with my co-authors. And the, the one thing I would say is this. Um, in the Journal of Economic Literature published two years ago, Josh Zivin and Matt Nidell wrote a paper called Human Capital and the Environment, where what they argue in their long survey paper, and I'm going to make my golden goose point again, and I'll come back to the leader's incentives in, a, in, in 30 seconds. They argue in their paper that those nations that have a dirty environment, dirty air, dirty water, that their people will not function. And that, that, that human capital, that, that IQ and the ability to concentrate all decline in a polluted environment. And so as the leader of China seeks to build the military power of China and to exude his power, I would say it's actually in his interest to tackle the environment because China will be a, a greater nation and a larger macro economy with a cleaner environment. And so I, I do take your point that if there was a, a crackdown on environmental civil society, if there was a crackdown on the microblogs. So for example, on the microblogs, you now need to give your name. Uh, and I have asked Sichi whether this has dampened the willingness of people to speak their mind now that it says Matt Kahn rather than handsome man is my handle. <laughs> and, and she has sent me some data that, that my pessimism, which is correlated with some of the things you said, was overstated. But I think that you raised the right the right criteria for judging whether our optimism is misplaced, of, of, of items to keep our eye on. Again, the only half counterpunch I want to pose is 
At the end of the day, the golden goose in capitalism is the brain. And China has invested a fortune in building up skill. And if pollution impedes the ability to learn and to use the brain, then out of self-interest, the leadership of China, a rising great nation, has strong incentives to tackle the issue out of its own self-interest. So economists always come back to self-interest. Notice I made no morality arguments. I never said it's the right thing to do to clean the environment. I focused on the incentives of households, firms, local government, and national government. And so your, your, your question is very well taken, but, but I hope folks at this late hour heard my response. Uh, the woman in the front here. Uh, hi, I'm Ray Su uh, from Middlesex University. Um, I also research about urban tourism. Um, I think um, one of the issues about city mayor, which you have mentioned already, is because city mayor probably they have the uh, strong power. And I think like in China, the land, uh, there are three kinds of land they will use, uh, commercial, uh, residential, and the industrial. So uh, only industrial land is quite cheap um, for renting or for selling. So city mayor, they will use uh, the encourage to, to sell in this kind of industrial land uh, to improve their achievement. Because in China, like all, each city mayor, they need to how to say, elected every five years. So in these five years, they need to maximize their achievement. So selling land probably is one of the approach. Um, my question is, do you think this kind of, I mean, um, governance approach m made by city mayor, do you think that maybe is kind of problem for um, city government to deal with this kind of um, environmental issues? So two points there that I didn't mention. Farmers at the suburban fringe have had their land taken by urban mayors. So folks, a nifty arbitrage play, if you ever want to get rich, is go up to farmers at the suburban periphery of a Chinese city, offer them the present discounted value of their agricultural land, Take that land and then sell it to urban developers at the urban price, and you will be a billionaire very quickly. That, that was a half joke. But, but the, 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 that is the play for, uh, for, for so for, as cities expand, um, there's a takings from farmers to, to these areas. What Sichi has argued with <laughs> regards to stability in China is that China needs a property tax. If you had a property tax, you would have a regular flow of income from all the productive properties within your area versus relying on land sales, and which are sort of lumpy, a one-time fee that you collect, and then there's no more flow of money. And so many real estate economists in China have hoped that there would be a, a property tax system in China. And my view there is a mayor who has a successful city with a job base and high quality of life that will be capitalized into home prices. Folks, London home prices are high because this is a great city to live in. And a mayor, if he gets 1% of that in property tax revenue, sits on a very large amount of money to allocate and is a more powerful mayor. The mayor of Detroit has very little income to distribute. Uh, Los Angeles, which is not a productive place, there is not, the only productive person in Los Angeles is Kobe Bryant. You, it would cost you $1.1 trillion to purchase all of LA County's real estate. It's because of quality of life that it would cost you $1.1 trillion. Nobody works in LA. Because it's a great place to live, people go there and then interact and form companies. Silicon Beach exists in Santa Monica because Google and, and Facebook footloose employees want to live in Santa Monica. And so uh, my basis is uh, cities with great quality of life in this footloose era. Again, those mayors will have a property tax base and then will have power and influence over investing in public goods. Question at the back here. Yeah, I have a question. Thanks. Uh, David Peerless at Mizuho. Um, manuf getting manufacturing out of Beijing, that's quite a a big one. It, it can't be all that long ago when Hyundai was looking at investing in China. They chose Herbei. 
And then the mayor of Beijing said, come here, I'll give you free land. Now they've got to go. What are the pra have you done any work on the practicalities of actually making that happen and so, so on? So they're free to choose. So, a, so the, in a capitalist setting, what would happen, so cities like Los Angeles deindustrialized. The mayor did not throw firms out of Los Angeles. In, in the case of Los Angeles, a, a, a manufacturing business would take a look at what are local wages, what's local real estate prices, what's local environmental regulation, could I earn higher profits in another location. I agree with every word you said. The, the distinction I would want to make is a manufacturing plant is a bundle. It creates, it creates middle class jobs, but it also creates pollution. But different industries have different pollution intensity. So for the firms you named, I'd like to know how dirty those firms were. What's happened in both the Hong Kong region and in Beijing is that factories have been locating within their airshed and pollution has been blowing back in. So there's a, sort of a localized cross-boundary problem. And I think with just a little bit of atmospheric chemistry, academics in China can show the government where do you need to nudge businesses to to have the best of both worlds, to have productivity, and but to minimize environmental spillover costs. I, I, I am not comfortable with command and control. What, what, I, what I hope folks heard me say is you're going to see different cities in China engaging in different policies. And, and where some of the coastal cities are going to have more intense environmental regulation. And for-profit firms will be free to choose where they locate to go. Now, with state-owned enterprises, the government has the power to close those down. Uh, I'd need to speak to an environmental lawyer for private companies whether the government can unilaterally do that. But that the incentive, Beijing is deindustrializing. There's a question of how fast this is occurring. But just like in US cities, the transition from manufacturing to services uh, is, is happening in many of these cities. And I view that as a good thing in terms of blue skies. But there's a question for those committed to income inequality and concerned about income inequality. Uh, what do the less educated do in these superstar cities if you're losing manufacturing jobs? But folks, that's why I talked about my bullet train work and the potential for jobs to decentralize and for such individuals to work in second tier cities nearby. And so that was the reason I presented that work to you. Uh, where, because it would be a shame if China had environmental progress, but only the rich could live in these cities. And so there's a question of what is your social welfare function for how you evaluate whether the good life is improving just for the rich or across the income spectrum. And my point about showing you the bullet trains is this investment in a system of cities creates more of a menu such that China's urban middle class can have their equivalent of the Chinese dream of a larger apartment, privacy, safe food, clean air, things that people in the United States take for granted under our American dream. Question at the front here. Thank you. <clears throat> Peter Hart, I'm a visitor here. We've heard a lot about the um, reaction to the pollution, the uh, filters and the masks that people use, but surely the answer is to tackle the problem nearer the source. Um, to use uh, chemical cleaners and uh, grit arresters and precipitators at the power station. You don't have to have pollution from coal burning. I once read how many lorry loads of sulfate were coming out of Battersea station, power station in the 20s, um, and it was quite considerable. You can take out these um, offensive chemicals, uh, sulfur dioxide and well, not nitrous exercise, more from cars, but um, you can, of course, take the carbon dioxide out, but this is costly. But a better idea for this is to maintain forests and woods in the urban environment. Now, China is held back into, to some extent by a lack of rainfall, but I mean, uh, we understand that a lot of the forest and the natural environment has been destroyed. The other thing, of course, you can do is to break the coal down to its four basic constituents, coke, uh, gas, liquor, and uh, tar, and burn the gas, which is clean. But of course, this costs money. 
they, these things may be doing be being done, but they're not particularly effective. So this is an excellent point, folks. If 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 anyone in this room reads our book, some of the themes he just named we discuss in the supply side. I'm an economist, I'm not an environmental engineer, and I wanted to focus on what are the new things we've done. If you sit down and read our book, for 40% for of the, the interesting points he just listed, we go through that systematically. We talk at length, so China is driving more and more cars. We talk at length about the Euro 6 standards that cars face. We talk about regulation of industry and regulation of coal-fired power plants. It borders on environmental engineering, and our intellectual contribution there is, is low. Uh, of a, we, we are citing other people's work. But he's absolutely right that if China really wants blue skies, a couple of options. You shut down all production, but that would be costly. You could have the same production but engage in scrubbers having catalytic converters. That imposes costs on firms and on consumers. And we talk about the economic incidence of that. Or for that pollution which you end up producing, the population can migrate to cleaner parts of the city, engage in mass and air filters. And we're going to see all of these margins of adjustment. But, but I agree with you. The, in the name of saving time, I spent almost no time on the first four chapters of our book on the supply of pollution, of how, as an unintended byproduct of China's coal burning, industrial production, and car use, with current technologies, where this pollution came from. But folks, Los Angeles drives 100% more miles than it used to, but its emissions per mile have fallen by 99%. So there's been sharp improvement. I'm getting my ratios wrong. Their emissions per mile has fallen so quickly in Los Angeles that despite people in Los Angeles driving more than ever, air pollution has fallen sharply. So regulation and industrial emissions reductions can go a long way in reducing pollution. But I would say that a key point there is will government adopt those policies? And will consumers rebel against those policies? And so to trigger the supply side regulatory responses, you need government to step in. And I claim you need people demanding these improvements because there is no free lunch. But you are right that these technologies do exist to break the link between pollution and production. Any more? Not left here. Um, hi, my name is Ashley. I'm a recent LSE grad. Um, you spoke to some of the costs on human capital. Um, so you're sort of you discussed the effect, the direct effect on people of some of this pollution. But what about some of the other environmental costs? So, you know, other aspects, other <laughs> environmental costs of, of development in China that might not have such a direct effect, whereby people are buying a mask or buying a filter. But um, you know, sort of the the effect on the environment as a whole, or the more complex forms of of <laughs> environmental degradation. So let's do a couple there. And she just put her finger on a weakness of the book. So, but a book can't do everything. Uh, to rephrase what she said, and she's on to me. She said, Matt, what does your book have to say about China's growth for ecosystems? For, for, for parts of China that are far from the cities. So folks, let's do an example together and let me talk about organic food. So China has had milk scandals. Many Chinese urbanites purchase milk in Hong Kong and other places out of fear for their milk. There's questions of how these, these cows, uh, where the pollution came from. But folks, watch the following Chicago argument. Folks are yawning at the Chicago economist. You're, you're lucky the stage is seven feet high. The, that was a joke. <laughs> if Chinese consumers, product differentiation point. So in US supermarkets, there's organic food and there's non-organic food. The non-organic food has pesticides and it's cheap. The organic food is more expensive and has no chemicals. Folks, why does capitalism deliver that? Because there's a demand. There's a group of consumers who, because they care about their health and they care about their children's health, and because they have the income, they're willing to vote their pocket for organic food. Farmers face a choice. They can, it, knowing that there's some government or non-governmental organization who certifies 
which food is organic or not. They face a choice. Do I incur the extra cost of not using pesticides and I grow the green product and sell it at a price premium? Or do I use the pesticides and sell at a price discount a conventional product? And, and those farmers self-select into organics and non-organics. Now let me answer her question. If there is a growth of urban consumers who want cleaner, safer food in the farmland, and if farmers are aware that there is some entity who can judge whether the food is truly organic or not. And of course, a nefarious businessman would take pesticide food and label it as organic. But let us, let us assume that does not happen. But that's a question of institutions, and that's a question of competition. Chinese, there's many smart people in China. There could be a way to figure out how to implement a regime. Santa Claus, who knows who's naughty and nice, there, if there was a way to classify Chinese products in the market into those that are conventional versus those that are organic. And if there's enough urban middle class people who demand the low risk products, that would incentivize those in the countryside to change their ways, to move their farming practices away from toxic waste sites and away from hazards that are endangering them. So yes, the cities are far from ecosystems, but if the cities are purchasing products from there, product differentiation and capitalism, just as there is a Mercedes versus a, a, a small car, capitalism has a way to differentiate products. And in some cases, you can protect the environment through product differentiation. Sichi and I are very interested in the rise of organic products in China. If there's cynics in the room who say, oh, these will be mislabeled, then there's a business opportunity for some young do-gooder in the room to come up with a way to correctly certify these products. Because even I think it would be a tragedy if a businessman could take a dirty conventional milk product and label it as organic to unsuspecting mothers. But if we can have competition between certifiers, and if, if a trusted certifier emerged, that some of the challenges she raised could be solved through competition. A, other things that happen in the United States is the Nature Conservancy. Folks, what the Nature Conservancy is, is a land trust. People, like my wife, donate dollars to the Nature Conservancy, give it to the Nature Conservancy to purchase land so that it's not developed. If there is worries in China about ecosystem destruction, then in this communist country, the introduction of land markets and land conservation trusts would be one way for the urban, increasingly wealthy people to vote their dollars for environmental protection. And so, yes, I'm an environmental and urban economist. Our book does not touch that much on, on ecosystems outside of the cities, but I've just sketched two mechanisms through which urbanites can vote their pocketbook to increase sustainability in these areas. And I think that's an important topic for future research. Because urbanites are in an open economy. They are importing goods and services. And there's a question of whether this path is sustainable. She's right. But it's more likely to be sustainable if the urbanites foresee the consequences of business as usual strategies and have incentives out of self-interest of improved health to have food of higher quality with less pesticides and the absence of toxics. Charlie in the blue jumper. Yeah. Um, that's very interesting, uh, Matt, talking about some of the policy issues for China now. I know you're sort of slightly dismissive of use of command and control to get pollution under control, but given this sort of the deindustrialization de de of the Chinese cities and factors being pushed down to countryside, do you think there, there's a limit to the kind of use of markets and incentives to, you know, sort of uh, you know, basically make, make cities more green and the country more green overall? Um, when you look at the history of London and other cities in Europe and North America, the history of command and control going side by side with the use of incentives um, to get, get a handle on pollution. But given that pollution of factories in China's countryside is as bad as it was in cities, I mean, you're very well pushing it from one place to another, but you still need some kind of uh, strong regulatory system above all of this at the federal, federal level to actually get a grip on the problem rather than just exporting it out of cities. So I agree. So I was mentioning the Euro 6 vehicle emission standards. So that's a quantity restriction on emissions per mile, and new vehicles have to meet that standard. And so that's a case where if more and more Chinese cars meet Euro 6 standards, then you break the link between miles driven and emissions. So I agree. It's with. Ch 
China has introduced plenty of command and control. For example, they've got rules that in Beijing that you can only drive your car two or three days a week. And so they're experimenting with many rules. And, and so we in the book describe what the Chinese government is implementing. But as economists, we come back to the unintended consequences of this. So it's been documented. So folks, if you have a rule that if you have an odd last digit of your license plate that you can only drive on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, rich people buy a second car. And so, and so there's a whole economics literature on how people respond to, 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 to restrictions. And w when economists can be useful is when we anticipate unintended consequences. For example, uh, Vernon Henderson is here and wrote a famous paper roughly 20 years ago where he documented that in the United States, because big cities have more severe environmental regulation, this has the unintended consequence of moving, of incentivizing dirty factories to move to less regulated areas. And in terms of protecting public health, that's actually a good thing, but it was not the intent of the EPA with its differential enforcement uh, to push factories out. It just wanted to focus effort on reducing the emissions of factories in big cities. And so economists are earning their living, uh, not when we're talking about macroeconomics, but, but, but when we're anticipating incentive effects of, of regulation. And, and I think it's very important, as China's government launches many regulatory efforts, for us to think about the intended and unintended consequences. And I, I yes, I think I will stop my thought there. <laughs> the back. Hello, uh, name's Adam, and I'm an engineer. Um, just a question in associated with leadership. Um, would you say either the Chinese government or the Chinese people are looking to provide leadership from an environmental perspective going into the future, maybe looking, say, 2050, for example? Or would you say, or if they're not looking to provide a leadership, where are they looking to for leadership from an environmental perspective? I don't know if that's is that clear. It's a very interesting question. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, which I should do more often. <laughs> it's. What I find very interesting about your question is the following, and I can only give a half answer. Remember how I set this up up front. I contrasted local pollution with global pollution. So folks, what I want an engineer to think about is the following. Because, because Beijing's pollution for particulate matter lands on its own people, it has the right incentives to think about these costs, and the leadership is going to be local. This, there's a woman at Princeton named D Denise Mazul who actually estimates how much of Los Angeles' pollution blows in from China, and it's roughly 5%. It's, in it's interesting. But most of China's local pollution ends up in China's areas. Where leadership is really needed is on the greenhouse gas emissions challenge. And my hope is the following on climate change. If you remember two-thirds through my lecture, I was talking about soft power. And my hope is that, is that Europe, India, China, the US, and other leading nations begin to carve out, to cap greenhouse gas emissions would be an insurance policy. Your grandchildren are more likely to have a high quality of life if we can get this global externality under control. We, we've had past success. For example, we came up with ways to stop the proliferation of nuclear weapons. The world has had some successes. I don't want to overdo this. I flunked out of international relations. Hey, the, 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 the world has had some successes with international treaties. Uh, issues of, of, of poisonous gases. It interests me very much when the world's nations can work together for the common good. Which nation will provide leadership here? I actually don't know the answer to that. It, it, as an economist, if it could become cheaper to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So, so one smart point here. Walmart, Walmart the company, has committed to go 100% green to get all of its power from renewables and solar. If I have argued that they will be better able to achieve that goal at lower cost because China's making a big investment in wind turbines and, so, and solar panels. It, it, if China, with its mass production engine, with its scale economies of production, can lower the cost of green renewable power generation, then that because demand curves slope down, 
other nations will be more likely to adopt solar panels and wind turbines because of China's mass production. So an interesting tension is, in this picture, China is a climate change villain. But the amazing part of China, with, with its scale and with the power of its central government, is the ability to make a big green push on renewables. So I think China is going to make a leadership push due to its pursuit of the solar and electric vehicle and wind turbine industries. I'd be pleasantly surprised if they play, play a key leadership role working with President Obama and other leaders to, to sign a binding deal. So I think where the leadership is going to come from is through through mass production of cheaper wind turbines and solar panels, encouraging other nations to adopt this. So that isn't political leadership, it's sort of economic muscle, but focused on the green economy. And that's a testable hypothesis. Because the price of wind turbines and solar panels has fallen sharply. And a key question is, if China hadn't entered this industry, how much more expensive would they be? And if, and if China is helping to lower the price of wind turbines, solar panels, and electric vehicles, they should be applauded for that investment as, as environmentalists. Or we as environmentalists should, should applaud that. I've, Steve, I've not given one out. Any further questions? OK. Well, we can wrap up. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. Matt.